Here is the new observer, and they've got an interview with Theresa May saying that she's going to fine greedy bosses who betray their workers by failing to pay into their pension pots. Uh, the Sunday Times, there is a story about Momentum Corbyn allies' plot to oust 50 Labour MPs. Again, we'll be talking much more about that. The Sunday Telegraph, we should welcome Trump visit, says Boris. There's a lot of Boris all over the papers today, I wonder why. Sunday Express, the Brexit enforcers. 100 Tory MPs are going to are vowing to help keep Theresa May on the straight and narrow when it comes to Brexit, they say. Jacob Rees-Mogg, no surprise that he's involved at all. And finally, the Mail on Sunday. Top Tories in Chinese cash for Brexit, furore. But is it really a furore, or is this a sting that didn't sting? We'll talk more about that as well. Uh, Catherine, let's start by talking about the, the Observer's exclusive with Theresa May. Um, they've got there to write a piece, and it's quite a substantial piece. It's a really strong piece, yes, uh, saying that boardroom excesses can no longer be tolerated, the economy has to work for all. And there's a quote here, too often we've seen top executives reaping big bonuses for recklessly putting short-term profit ahead of long-term success. So it's strong language. Um, we've obviously heard Theresa May talk about this before, uh, on the steps of number 10 most famously, but I think this language is really strong. I guess the question is whether we'll an see anything actually happen. Because I think course, the public as mood... Ever. Yes. As ever, the public mood has shifted very dramatically in the last couple of years mm. um, against turbocharged capitalism, against high executive pay, um, and something needs to be done. The question is whether this will be enough. Will be enough. I'm glad I've... she read it for The Observer, though. She obviously knows how to get impact for stories. Now, I did say The Observer was looking different. Like The Guardian this yes. week, it's changed rather dramatically. And, of course, when you relaunch a paper, you're also taking something away from readers. So you have to <laughs> ensure that they recognise that the paper has changed. And you've called these tabloids, not compacts. Why? Well, they're just smaller papers, um, so I don't mind what pe people call them, really, as long as they uh, find the good, strong Guardian and Observer journalism they're used to, uh, just in this really lovely new format. And in fact, it was a great opportunity to think about what's the role of print in people's lives. The Guardian's got 150 million readers around the world, uh, but so when they're all digital. So the people who want to buy print, what is it they want from us? And I think they want something tangible and um, physical to keep hold of. But there is a real problem. I'll talk about this with Tina Brown later on as well, which is that simply people are buying less print. And therefore, you have to find an alternative way of earning your bread, yeah. earning your lunch. Uh, the, the Times has its subscription model, which seems to be working quite well. But you've got a very different model. So our model is more of a sort of voluntary paywall rather than a compulsory paywall. We still have lots of subscriptions and they do um, well for The Guardian as well, both digital and um, in print. But yes, our new model um, is, it's for the last 18 months, has been a really successful model. I think people were very surprised because it's based on membership to support the journalism. You don't get anything back. You don't get many sort of freebies or uh, anything like that. But what you do is you support Guardian Journalism. And you and feel better for that. You, you feel warm inside. Yeah, and you, feel, and you feel that you're keeping... Lots of people say to us that the, one of the reasons they want to give us money is that it helps keep the Guardian Journalism available to everyone. And obviously that only works for organisations like The Guardian. You need a strong mission. Uh, you need perhaps something very distinctive, which The Guardian is the world's biggest progressive news organisation, certainly is. Um, and you also need, I think, a close relationship with your readers. Um, and we've got all of those things. So it's, it's working quite well so far. We've got more than 800,000 um, people who give us money at the moment. James Cleverley, Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. Perhaps not a glaring surprise that you've chosen the <laughs> Sunday Times splash about momentum tightening its grip. Let's just talk a little bit first about the story and then we'll talk about its origins and so Yeah, on. sure. Well, uh, what we have here is what we've seen happening subtly at the national level, which is uh, momentum really uh, tightening its grip on the Labour Party. We saw the NEC elections where they've they certainly it really well consolidating. There, yes. yeah. um, and what we're seeing here now is this uh, playing out at local government level, which is going to be the first time that we see the kind of momentum ideas really put into practice. And we have a story here uh, about uh, momentum gets its clutches on the first uh, council. We've got the London local uh, government elections coming up later on this year in the spring. Uh, okay. And we've got uh, some indications yeah. of, the, of the kind of policies, including uh, cutting the salaries of public employees who are earning over £60,000 sure. a year. Um, on the front page, they've said Corbyn allies are going to oust 50 Labour MPs, which sounds very dramatic. When you look at it, it's based on a single, unattributable, anonymous quote. Mm. And Momentum have put out a story saying this is a, just a, a tissue of nonsense. It's, it's very, very thin. And certainly, I was hoping to read who the 50 Labour MPs are. I was hoping to read who in Momentum was doing this. I was hoping to read a little bit more about it. And I can't find any of that in the paper. Indeed. And we might come on to why that's probably not the 
not the strongest story for a front page splash on a national newspaper we'll in, in a minute that, later right. on. Yeah, yeah. OK, well, let, let's keep moving ahead, um, because there is quite a tough story, uh, again, for the Conservatives inside the Sunday Times. This is Michael Gove and others, I would say, on manoeuvres, Kath. Is that a fair <laughs> phrase? Well, it's, it's this, uh, these amazing quotes from Nick Bowles, who's um, a former housing minister, um, still a, a Tory MP. He said, he described, we have a government full of boiled rabbits. <laughs> Uh, which is apparently an Orwellian phrase, um, a George Orwell phrase, saying uh, that he thinks that the uh, government's full of people who are either wet, uh, i.e. Okay. meaning soft, or um, they are not brave enough to be radical and that uh, it's a sort of timid government. Because he's so vivid, I'm going to read the whole quote, yeah. we'll most of it. We have a government full of boiled rabbits. Theresa May needs to give ministers their head and she needs to tell them to follow their convictions. And ideally, she needs to have a few convictions herself. Ouch! What do you make of that, James Cleverly? Well, unsurprisingly, I don't agree with Nick. <laughs> What's going um, on? I don't know. I don't know where this is uh, where this has come from. We've just uh, um, Catherine's just said in the uh, Observer uh, the Prime Minister set out her views about corporate responsibility and, and big business, which were uh, a, 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 a a reflection of the things that she was saying on the steps of Downing Street, where she set out her vision. She, and unlike she's Kath, made it very you would clear. expect there are going to be really strong actions to follow these warm words. Well, I think that uh, the fact that she has, has made such a powerful statement in uh, The Observer indicates that we are very much focused on getting a grip of this kind of stuff. and People expect that. But the point that I was making is this is not new. This mm. is not... This is not a response to things that have happened. This is her, this is her, her long-standing position on these you, issues. You've been a big Boris supporter in the past. We see Boris all over the front page of the Sunday Telegraph. And again, in this story, it's said that Boris Johnson is going to win a great big cabinet battle to put more money into the NHS after Brexit. Is he on manoeuvres? <laughs> <When I, laughs> uh, not as far as I know. Silly question. I know, silly question. Not as far as I know. All right. So as thin as the momentum story, perhaps, you think? Quite possibly, yeah. Let's move on to something that's definitely not thin, because it's in his own words. John McDonnell, Shadow Chancellor, talking in the Sunday Mirror about his plans for the NHS and an emergency budget. Yes, yeah, so this... Uh, the, um, John McDonnell says that if he were Chancellor at the moment, he would unveil an emergency budget next week for the NHS, providing um, £5 billion uh, input. And he'd, he'd do this by taxing um, higher earners more. Um, and this is, um, this is stuff we know up to a point already in terms of the high rates of tax, but he's bringing it forward. He's saying uh, it's, about mom it's about momentum in a different sense, I suppose. <laughs> Early days of a Labour government, this is the first thing we do, an emergency budget, more money for the NHS. And Labour clearly think, James, that there is a mood out there for people to pay a little bit more tax to, as it were, save the NHS. This is a, another watershed moment, if you like, in politics. Well, it depends. Um, if, if the Labour Party were honest enough to say we're going to pump extra spending into the NHS and you are going to pay more tax, I'd probably have a little bit more respect. But once again, what we're seeing is the Labour Party saying they're going to no. pump money in and someone o else... O over 80,000 you pay more, but, quite a few of those. But the point being is the vast majority of British people in reality will be paying more tax under Labour's plans, and come on to that in a minute. But um, what they keep doing is they keep saying, we'll spend mm. all this extra money, but don't worry, someone else will foot the bill. And that's just... I think, fundamentally dishonest uh, position mm. to, to hold with the British people. Now, the Telegraph has a story in which the Centre for Policy Studies, which is a right-of-centre think tank, yeah. we should say, yeah. has costed some Labour spending plans when it comes to renationalisation. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Um, and the figure they've put on it, uh, which um, uh, they've calculated it, £176 billion pounds to renationalise uh, these public utilities and, and, and the rail companies. And to put that into perspective, that is, that is about the same size as the NHS budget and the defence budget put together. If um, it's true. Well, if, uh, even if the figure's slightly off, you know, we're not looking at an order of magnitude error. You're looking at something at or near, you know, 100, 150 billion. And that is a massive amount of money. Yeah. And, of course, once again, someone's going to have to pay. And they've calculated well, that Well, we'll certainly be talking to John McDonnell about that later on. Can yeah. I ask a little bit more about the story I described as the sting that maybe didn't sting yeah. quite strongly enough? It's on the front page of the Mail on Sunday, and then it's inside... Uh, the Mail on Sunday, and there are some suggestions the Sunday Times had it too. They were working with Channel 4's dispatches programme, and they did a classic sting operation. They set up a little office in Mayfair, and they had a Chinese lady who brought in three leading Conservatives, and she tried to persuade them to do something improper. And sadly for everybody, <laughs> they didn't. Well, this is, uh, <laughs> this is the point I was making about uh, those 
seeming gaps uh, in, in, in the times. The Mail on Sunday has gone uh, what is still a big splash. But when you actually look at the language, it's, it's, all, it's all about what was done to the MPs uh, and, the, and MPs the peers, said. not what they've actually said. And it seems to be, as far as I can make out, and I've read through this, through this in quite a bit of detail, okay. that they were approached and they all said, that's very, very interesting. I'll consult, I'll consult the parliamentary authorities and get back to you, which is, is exactly what they were not <laughs> supposed to do. They were supposed to say, yeah, yeah, give it yeah. to me. Yeah. So a bit of a bit of a non-story. Big splash on a bit of a non-story. Catherine, as, as a newspaper editor, nothing worse than having a really big story that you're getting excited about, you're preparing your you know, emptying space across the paper for, <laughs> and it's not quite ready on the day. Well, especially if people know about it, which is what happened in this case. I think it's best if you try and keep these incredibly secret so that uh, yeah. no one knows about it when you yes. fail to deliver. Your next story is, we go a little bit further afield, but yep. there's still a British connection to the, the talks in Germany between Angela Merkel and the Social Democrats. Yep. And it's a crunch day today because there's a vote among the Social Democrats about whether their um, leader, um, whether they should go into a grand coalition with Merkel's Conservatives. And I think it's um, particularly interesting because, according to this terrific piece in The Observer, um, that the people who are most opposing the idea of a, um, an, an alliance with, it, with Merkel are the young activists in the Social Democrats. Mm. They say um, they, they want a chance for the um, SPD to renew itself. Um, they want to prevent the, the far right, the AFD, from being the official opposition in the Bundestag. Um, and so they may prevent this from happening. And again, the idea that it's the youth wing um, causing all the um, okay. excitement, I think, is very interesting. And that's really, parallels no, it's, to it's, here. It's, it's and really the vote's today. Fascinating story. Yeah. We were watching very closely. Now, a few days ago, James, I noticed that Nigel Farage said something quite odd. He said that we <laughs> Brexiteers, he said, are losing the argument. Things are going backwards. Something's going to have to change. And he wondered, what's he up to? The Sunday Times thinks it knows what he's up to. Apparently, uh, he seems to feel that not being the leader of a political party is, uh, is, is, is something he's unhappy with as a status um, and uh, he, there is now talk about him launching a new political party uh, which I think is uh, which I think is is interesting and obviously the you know the divisions within within UKIP and their internal arguments are, are, are boiling up here and uh, do we uh, both think that Henry Bolton can survive as leader of UKIP <laughs> I'm not sure it's that relevant to be honest with you. I think this is the challenge that UKIP have got now is that they are just no longer relevant. I mean, what is the question to which UKIP is the, is the right answer? I certainly don't know. A long pause there. Thank you both <laughs> very much. That was a really good counter, indeed a gallop through the newspaper stories. Thanks very much. And so